So a while back, one of my patrons asked if there was anybody who could rip some tapes that they'd found by accident in a load of miscellaneous stuff they got from somebody. They didn't know what was on them, but I love watching unknown videotapes, so I offered. And what was on them was pretty neat, and it led me down a bit of a rabbit hole into the largely forgotten history of a video game that, as far as I can tell, never really made it to market. And honestly, that part might be less interesting than the footage itself. And in fact, I'd like to show you the tapes themselves before I even get into the footage, because you might not have ever seen one of these before. Statistically speaking, I'd guess anyone watching this has a pretty good idea what a VHS tape looks like. Very likely you've handled one before, but also statistically speaking, at this point, I'd guess you've probably never handled a Betamax tape, so you might not know that they were pretty dang small. So if you don't know, here, this is Betamax. See, it's quite a bit smaller than VHS. And that was really convenient when Sony chose the same cassette to make their professional beta cam format. And this is one of those tapes. From the outside, it looks exactly the same, but it stores a much better picture. And these were very popular in 80s and 90s news camcorders, partially because they're so compact. It's sure no mini DV, but let me tell you, back in the early 80s, a camcorder that took one of these could be a lot smaller than one that took full-size VHS, which wasn't even as good. Now, this isn't the kind of tape I was sent. I just needed you to see this one so you'd get the irony. See, this is Betacam, the tape that was small enough to make a conveniently sized camcorder, and this is also Betacam, specifically Betacam Large. Not that I needed to tell you that. These original little tapes just didn't have the runtime to archive footage or edit together long programs, even after Sony packed in as much tape as they possibly could. So they came up with a bigger one, one that definitely doesn't fit in a camcorder, but was great for studio work. This is my favorite videotape format. I love it. As a six foot two creature with gigantic ogre mitts, videotapes tend to feel pretty small in my hands, but not these ones, these feel about right. Seriously, they don't look that big in my hands, but look at this compared to VHS, okay? These tapes are monstrous. There are larger formats out there, but they're usually failures or incredibly rare and expensive, uh, and these are neither of those things. To say these were used heavily is the understatement of the century. As I understand it, from about 1983 all the way up to the 2010s in some places, virtually every person working in broadcasting handled these monster tapes on a daily basis, which just tickles me. So now that you get the joke of these tapes, uh, what's actually on them? Well, the labels don't reveal much. Uh, we've got the word network. Uh, we have a word here that looks like cyber pack or cyber park. And we've got some names, uh, Eddie, Brad, and what looks like Genie. These tapes came in gargantuan boxes, but those are labeled about the same way. So there's not really much to go on here. There's no production company. There's no description of what it actually is. That's all the data we have. So we're going to have to see what's actually on here. Now, obviously, you need a huge VCR to play these huge tapes, and obviously I have one, uh, but unsatisfied with how big it was, I made mine bigger. This is my video interface rack. It has all the stuff for capturing and outputting standard definition video, and this here is my Betacam deck. This is a pretty typical design. It's four very heavy rack units tall, and as you can see, it does indeed have a gigantic slot for these gigantic tapes. I can put this in here, but I can't really describe how disconcerting it is in person to put this huge tape in this gigantic VCR and watch it get pulled inside. Things this big shouldn't move on their own. I don't like it. Also, if you're curious, no, you do not have to get a separate deck to view the smaller tapes. Take this guy out, just put one of these right in, and it plays it no problem. And I'm going to have a video eventually about how that works and how common it used to be, but I digress. Betacam was a really high quality format. In fact, it stores broadcast grade full component video. So if you find one of these, you know you have something that came from a business. No consumer ever owned one of these decks, unless they were a nerd who got a surplus from a TV studio. So whatever's on here, it's from a professional video outfit. And that's why I was interested, because you never know what you'll see on a commercial tape. So I set up my capture station, put the tape in, hit play, and I was astonished at what popped up. 
All the footage on the tapes depicts the same kind of thing. An actor in a costume standing in a completely blue room, illuminated from all sides, striking and holding poses while facing in different directions. And as soon as I saw this, I knew exactly what it was. They're making sprites. If you know how video games are made, you'll know what those are. But if that's the case, then you already got the whole story and you can find a chapter to skip to in the description. For everyone else, let's make a short story along. Without getting deep into the technical details, most two-dimensional video games, especially those made in the 80s, could make two different types of on-screen graphics. There were backgrounds, which could fill the entire screen, but had limited motion capabilities. And then there were sprites, which were usually very small, but could move anywhere they wanted. Mario is an example of a sprite. So are Koopas, Fireballs, and Mushrooms, all of which can move around the screen freely during the game. 3D games can also have sprites, in which case they're two-dimensional objects that can move around in a 3D world. That's a technique that used to be very common in mid-90s games, like the bob -Oms and Mario 64, and which still sticks around in modern games for things like explosions, fire, trees, that sort of thing. Sprites are made of bitmap images, in which some pixels represent the object or character, and the rest are flagged as transparent so the sprite can be composited into the game world. In modern games, this is done using a bitmap that includes a transparency or alpha channel, or sometimes by using separate alpha maps for each sprite. But in the past, this was often accomplished by using a special color that a game would treat as transparent, often a hot magenta that had no other valid purpose. Other than the transparency component, a sprite can be any image you want. Throughout the 80s, virtually all video game graphics, sprites and backgrounds, were created on a computer, drawn by hand with a tablet or a mouse. Although if you go back far enough, pixels were actually typed in manually as hex values. But in the 90s, it suddenly became relatively cheap and easy to get photographs or video into a computer. And that meant you could put an actor in a costume, take their picture, and turn them into a sprite. And that was very appealing. This would allow developers to make games with highly realistic characters instead of cartoonish ones, and they could have whatever clothing and accessories they wanted without needing to hand draw every single tiny detail of every outfit for every frame of animation. And for a while this had a major stylistic impact on the video game industry. The most memorable effect was the explosion of full motion video, or FMV, games in which the graphics were partially or entirely composed of video footage shot in real life. Sometimes this was limited to real characters composited into a virtual world in a non-interactive fashion. Sometimes games would contain cutscenes composed entirely of FMV, basically little movies, sometimes shot on complete real-world sets. And finally, some games were basically interactive movies. The entire game world consisted of video clips representing every possible action or outcome, and your decisions just selected which clip would play next. In retrospect, FMV is often considered a comical and even regrettable period in video game history. It's hard to take seriously, partially because the production values were often pretty crummy, partially because the video often integrated very poorly into the game world, partly because the player often had pretty limited options for interactivity, and partly because the graphics often just didn't look very good. There are exceptions for the cream of the crop titles, and in recent years there's been kind of an awesome renaissance in FMV games some of which take themselves more seriously than others. Hey kid, the name's Mickey. Mickey the Mechanic. This spinning thing is even better from the inside. But overall, I would say that FMV is usually thought of as a joke nowadays, and it was often seen that way back in the day. But a perhaps more fondly remembered use of the same techniques were digitized sprites. This is a similar but still distinct approach. You still start with photos or video to get the basis for your game graphics, but you don't have 30 or 60 FPS clips playing out in the game world. In other words, your video does not have full motion. Instead of playing a video clip of a character shooting a gun, you just have frames where they're aiming, firing, and recoiling, and you play those back to create the illusion of motion. In other words, you make the same kind of animation sets that are used with conventional hand-drawn sprites. The only difference is the pixels originate from photos instead of an artist's tablet. This took up a lot less storage space than FMV, it used less power to display, and it gave artists a lot more freedom since they didn't need to have perfectly clean video, just a few usable frames here and there. 
It also meant you weren't limited to human actors. You could use clay figures or models since they didn't need to actually move in the real world. They could be posed in different positions and photographed, which is, for instance, how they created some of the larger monsters in the original Doom. But practically speaking, games with digitized sprites were often more interactive than full FMV titles. To explain that a little, let's take a look at Gabriel Knight 2. This game used full FMV for cutscenes. Sometimes it was shot on real sets, uh, sometimes you had actors composited into virtual sets, but either way, during the cutscenes, you're just watching little movies. You can't interact with them at all. When you reach the interactive portions of the game, however, those also use footage of real actors. Your character is represented by video clips of an actual person that's been cut out so that he can move around and appear to be inside the game world. In a game design sense, these are undeniably sprites. But in my head, I don't really think of them that way because they don't really have an unlimited range of motion. They can't quite move anywhere on the screen, not because of technical limitations, but just due to the footage available. Each action you can take requires a video clip of that specific action, like turning away from the camera or turning to the side and walking from one place to another. And that means that Gabriel, that's me, Gabriel Knight, is limited to pre-planned and scripted motions. He can only exist in and interact with parts of the game world that they taped the actor existing in and interacting with. He can't be told to stand anywhere on the screen because there's only clips of him walking between specific locations. The middles of those animations can't be cut out because you'd notice it, and his position can't be altered to make him stop somewhere else or it would look unnatural. To be fair, this is nitpicking. It's possible to be more flexible than this, especially if you're willing to give up some realism, but the point is, using FMV for character animations is a tricky business with a lot of caveats. Digitized sprites, on the other hand, can do anything a conventional hand-drawn character can. They just look more realistic. Probably the most famous example is, of course, Mortal Kombat. It wasn't the first game to have digitized sprites, but it's one of the best remembered. The game contained a whole stable of unique fighters, all with complicated outfits that would have been a tremendous pain to draw by hand. And they look really impressive despite their low resolution, largely because they were photographed rather than drawn. Now, I wondered for years what this process looked like, but thanks to living in the future, we can now find behind the scenes videos on YouTube. So these are the real people that became the Mortal Kombat fighters, dressed up in costumes and doing their stuff, walking, jumping, doing martial arts moves, etc. But notice that they often aren't moving. They sometimes strike a pose and hold it. Instead of actually leaping through the air to do a flying kick, the actor lays on a platform in a carefully contrived position. Now, this might be because they couldn't actually do a lot of those moves, many of which were physically impossible, but it's also a practical necessity. See, it's not actually important that these actors be moving, because the game artists are just going to pick out still frames here and there to create sprites. Well, if the actors are actually moving, they could produce motion blur, which is no good for sprites. The artists want nice, clean frames to work from, because they're going to create the illusion of motion themselves. They take still frames representing a jump, a kick, and so on, and assemble a complete set for each character, an atlas, which the game engine will use to create animations on the fly. In other words, these work exactly like any sprite in any game in history. And that, in turn, means that Mortal Kombat doesn't need to limit the player's freedom of motion. Within the constraints of the stage, uh, the internal physics of the game world, and of course the character's moveset, you can go anywhere you want and perform any action you want at any time, because the characters aren't video clips. And I think that's probably why, despite digitized sprites themselves falling out of favor for new games decades ago, the ones that used them are remembered far more positively. They haven't really become dated. And to wit, Mortal Kombat could have been made with hand-drawn characters, and it would probably still be remembered as a timeless masterpiece. The game itself was good. They just made it very distinctly styled by doing it this way. And certainly, digitized sprites were not grounds for a game to be remembered positively all on their own. There were, of course, plenty of titles all over the quality spectrum. There were platformers, adventure games, and even first-person shooters, to name a few genres. So, returning to the tape, it's very clear that that's what we're looking at. The creation of digitized sprites. 
We have actors who are walking, they're pointing at things, they're making actions like they're picking stuff up, but they're mostly not continuous motions. When we see them moving, it's clearly just to get from one pose to another, and then they freeze there for a while, so the artist will have a number of frames to select from. The exceptions are when the actors are walking. You can fake kung fu kicks, but for a character to walk convincingly, you can't have someone strike a pose and hold it. It just doesn't work. To make a character's walk cycle animation, they have to be shown with their feet coming up and going down in perfect sync at the beginning and end of each step. And nobody can pose in the middle of a step and make it look real. So your reference has to be a person who's really genuinely walking. This can't be done. When Jordan Mechner was making the reference footage for Prince of Persia, he taped his brother running while he drove alongside in a car, and that worked, but the much easier approach, of course, is to just put your actors on a treadmill. That way you get the real thing. They're actually walking. You get the realistic motion of their feet coming up and going down to support their weight. Of course, you have to have a treadmill in the scene, but that's a reasonable trade to make for having truly realistic motion. So that's what they're doing here, putting the performers on a treadmill to get a realistic walk cycle. And much like all the other furniture these actors have been sitting on, the whole thing is painted blue. Now, the go-to thought is that this is a chroma key studio. I think everyone knows basically what that is, even if they know it by another name, like blue screen or green screen. We all generally know that if you wanna make it look like an actor is in a place they were never really in, you put them in front of a solid backdrop, have them do their thing, and use a computer later to delete all the blue or green parts, turning them transparent so the actor looks like they fit into a different background. But that's probably not quite what's going on. So that's an automated process, and it's a pretty picky one. Certainly, it would have been in the standard definition days, and it's not a whole lot easier now. You don't just press a button and all the blue parts disappear. There's a protracted process of tuning your software to understand what should be considered blue, and you have to create what's called a garbage mat to cut out pieces of scenery or equipment that ends up in the shot out of necessity, stuff like that. Also, ideally, you want to light your set as flatly and evenly as you can, because any shadows can become impossible to key out automatically. So if whoever made this was trying to make a chroma key set, they didn't do a very good job. It's not lit very evenly, there's shadows everywhere, the flywheel on the treadmill is way too close to the actor's feet, and it isn't blue, so you'd have to very meticulously design a mat all the way around that. The folds in the fabric covering the furniture have dark spots with almost no saturation, so pulling a key on those would be a mess, at least for me. Your mileage may vary if you're a more skilled VFX artist, but truthfully, I doubt they were ever really keying this at all. Chroma key is important for moving pictures because cutting a character out of their background 24 to 60 times per second is just way too much effort. But for a small number of static, low-resolution images, it's really not necessary. The amount of time it takes in a graphics package, now or then, to cut a character out from a background is so trivial that doing it automatically is almost more trouble than it's worth. Even trying to do this with the magic wand tool in modern Photoshop makes a total wreck of the picture and you just end up fixing it by hand anyway. So I would guess this room is blue only because it made it a bit easier for the artists to tell what was and wasn't part of a character. And that's probably true for other digital sprites as well. From what I've read, Mortal Kombat sprites were also edited out by hand, which we can tell because their set isn't really set up for chroma key either. If we go back and look, while the actors were up against a blue backdrop, the ground looks like concrete or paperboard or something. If they really intended to pull a key out of these pictures, there's no reason they wouldn't have put down a blue mat, so I'm pretty sure this was just to make it a little easier to do by hand. So anyway, nitpicks about the production process aside, it's at least obvious what this footage is. So the real question is, what was it for? What game did these sprites wind up in? Well, I've done my best to follow the few clues I can find. I think I've sleuthed it out, but it's pretty murky. So first off, we can be fairly sure when this footage was shot because there are title cards here and there with the year 1991, so there you go. I absolutely adore these, by the way, because they're clearly generated on a Mac, although with no program I can identify. It might be something they bodged together in HyperCard. Uh, but then they took the video from the Mac and put it through a switcher into their videotape deck. Wonderful. So we have the year, but the game could have been in development for who knows how long, so that doesn't nail it down much. We can also look at what the performers are doing. Each actor does each pose or walk cycle while facing in one of five directions. And this part might be a little unintuitive, but that means that these sprites were going to be used for an eight direction animation set. 
That's what you commonly see in top-down or isometric games where a character can face in all four cardinal directions as well as the 45 degree angles in between them. And you can see the little white pips on the ground that make sure that the actors are consistently hitting those 90 or 45 degree marks. Those kind of sprites are often drawn only at five angles and then the other three are made by flipping and mirroring the art, which saves about 40% of the effort. So this tells us that the game this was intended for wasn't a platformer or a fighter, for instance, because the character would usually be seen in profile. So they would have just faced in one direction and been mirrored for the other. If this were for an isometric game, something like Ultima 8 or maybe Diablo 2, the camera angle would probably be a lot higher. So instead, I'd guess this was for something closer to a Sierra or LucasArts adventure game, where the character can move left, right, and then towards and away from the player's perspective. It also doesn't appear to be an action game of any kind because there's no attacks, no injury animations, no jumps, no deaths, nothing like that. The only actions I can identify are walk, take, pick up from surface, pick up from ground, and repetitions of all the above while the actor is sitting. This rules out a lot of potential options, including most adventure games, and that really doesn't leave much on the table. In fact, there's only really one thing I can think of that this all fits with, and that's an online social space. I'm talking about stuff like uh, PlayStation Home, Second Life, Fricadia, things that are called games for lack of a better term, but are more like graphical chat rooms where you can move around, maybe pick things up or interact with stuff in a limited fashion, but you're not progressing a narrative or moving towards a goal. There's no enemies. It's just a place to see and talk to other people, plus dipping mustards. And everything I've found suggests that that's what this was for. Just the clues I'm going on are pretty thin. The labels on the boxes and tapes are nearly useless. If I could look up games that contained both a Brad and a Genie, that might work, but those are actually the names of the actors. I know this because the footage actually includes the room audio from time to time, and you can hear the director giving instructions to them by name. Uh, here, for no, instance. No, to your right, Suzanne, just uh, And again, here. And keep your shoulders back there, Brad. And unfortunately, a couple first names just aren't enough information for an effective search. Now, it's possible that the Eddie V listed on this tape was Eddie Venancio, a similar looking strongman who was in the very early digitized sprite game Pit Fighter, in which he depicted the character of Chain Man. Uh, somebody actually told me they matched up his tattoos. So it seems to be the same guy, but I can't find any games he was in other than Pit Fighter online. The only other things on the boxes are the words Network and Cyberpark. Uh, searches for network, of course, are useless. Now, Cyberpark turns up a few results, and those results started to suggest that network might refer to the Sierra Network. This was a service launched in the early 90s by Sierra Online, one of the most successful PC video game publishers and developers of the 80s and 90s. It was, in fact, an online social space, although it was built around a bunch of exclusive multiplayer games that were tied into the system, sort of like a more aggressive Steam now, I haven't found all that much information about the Sierra Network, but from what I have seen, all the games were in their sort of um, painterly house style, which wouldn't really match with realistic sprites like we have here, but they certainly published a wide variety of titles, so we'll ignore that for the moment. The Sierra Network enjoyed some success, I think, but in the end, Sierra didn't want to hang on to it, and they sold it to AT&T in 1994, who renamed it to the Imagination Network. And when it didn't catch on there either, they sold it off again to AOL in 1996. Now this is where I found the first connection. There are a couple articles from 96 talking about how this new INN product called Cyberpark would realize the recurring mythical future of cyberspace as an online virtual environment in which you could, quote unquote, be anyone. This was a huge meme in the 90s. It just kept coming up. The idea that computer-generated 3D environments would be the future of how we interacted and consumed information online was, without question, the dumbest obsession Silicon Valley has ever had. And that's saying so much. Along with video phones and 3D TV, this is one of those things that just kept surging and resurging, trying to become a thing despite nobody asking for it and offering no apparent benefits. There was, in fact, an entire massive, widely supported and deployed system for virtual 3D environments in the 90s called Vermal, which tons of technology writers and thinkers and companies were convinced was going to be the successor to HTML. For no reason! Nobody could ever explain how forcing users to find information by wandering around aimlessly inside of poorly rendered museums was supposed to make anything easier or better. 
but it just kept getting invented and reinvented throughout the 90s. And honestly, they still haven't given up on this crap. Of course, what made AOL unique amongst all these attempts I'm aware of is that they actually had a plan for how to make it profitable. Their cyberspace would let you gamble. Honestly, it's kind of astonishing it didn't take off just based on that. From the limited descriptions given in the mid-90s articles that mention this, I can see how the sprite work we saw in this video would have fit in. There would have been no use for outright violence in this environment or much interaction beyond reaching out and pulling the levers on slot machines or picking up a dropped token, so these sprites would be perfect. It also explains why each actor performs all the same poses in different costumes. That's kind of the clincher that these sprites weren't intended for any other game genre. They could have been intended for an RPG or an adventure game, but it'd be really weird for an adventure game to offer multiple characters. I don't think I've ever seen that. I mean, beyond like a gender choice or something. And what RPG limits you to specific outfits, almost none of which resemble armor? Uh, some of which definitely don't. It does, however, make sense for a social space to have a bunch of avatars that are functionally identical and just look different while being based on a variety of exaggerated, idealized body types. A comically swole guy, 90s hot chick, a Jedi. Did I mention the wardrobe on display here is stellar? I mean, it starts out with your basic uh, slam beef chest sporting his Beyond Thunderdome body armor look, but he's also available in Slam Beef Chest Goes to 7-Eleven at Midnight Mode. Picture him, just back from bending parking meters in half, making his way past each successive security camera as he beelines for the nacho dispenser. And then there's this outfit, which I can only describe as an escaped JoJo's character. We also cannot miss the last performer on the second tape, who is not only wearing an outfit that predicted Tane by like 15 years, but is also rocking a positively rancid swagger. This gate telegraphs a degree of not giving a shit that I've rarely achieved, even at my drunkest. I should mention this same person later shows up rocking a look that shouts nothing so much as, I'm on my way to the Mesopotamian market to sell some poor quality copper. Despite the total incongruity of all of this clothing, I think all games should look like this. We're missing a bet here. But as cool as all these cats look, the existence of this footage conflicts with most of the remaining coverage I found on Cyberpark, as well as what I dug up on Internet Archive. See, in 1996, so five years after these tapes were shot, Cyberpark put up a website, some of which got scraped by Internet Archive. It's incomplete, but that website had screenshots, and the ones we have make it very clear that this game was set in a 3D environment and featured heavy character customization. While sprite-based characters were often used in 3D games at the time, including other VR projects, they certainly wouldn't have been customizable. They, they just kind of aren't. Uh, while 3D ones would have been highly customizable, uh, which obviously would be appealing if you want to make your own unique persona. It's hard to pin down how this two-dimensional footage from 91 fits in here. Now, for a while, I didn't have much more to go on, but someone sent me a link to a Moby Games page for one Mike Kawahara with a timeline stating that they were working on an online game community called Cyberpark in 1992 and that it was sold to the Imagination Network. Now, there's very little further information out there, except that Mike also worked on a project called Worlds Away, which I realized I'd actually seen before in an incredibly wild BBC documentary from 1995 called The Net. You know, I'm running out of hard details about Cyberpark, but I think that just understanding the environment it was created in will tell you more than I possibly could. And The Net is a great introduction. This program was utterly batshit. It's supposed to be about the subject of virtual online worlds, but in my opinion, it's mostly just disjointed and bizarre. There's so many strange decisions, uh, like the man standing in public talking to a fake projection of a European MP on the side of a building with booming Big Brother reverb. Will the net make us feel more European and less attached to our national identities? Uh, I think you have three levels in the future. Or there are the interviews with various software company execs conducted entirely in Dutch angle close-up composited with partial transparency over a backdrop of clouds so it looks like you're talking to God. Is that the worlds are fairly constrained and they seem to be very boring. There are incredibly odd edits, like the hand that just pops out of nowhere in the middle of a clip and then vanishes with a sound effect. I see which we call the token. People are given a certain number of tokens for every uh, hour they spend online. For no apparent reason. 
While most of the video is edited with plain cuts, no wipes or fades, much like most nonfiction television, occasionally they throw in a really high effort transition in a spot where nothing is happening. There's this weird moment when a hand sweeps across the screen along with this sound effect. And then you start getting the ability to change your survival strategies. But it's not really illustrating anything. Why did this happen? Then there's a really startling moment later on when another hand just slaps the camera lens, accompanied by a thunderclap. Here we have actually the world's very first virtual escalator. Again, for a transition that is not associated with a story beat. It's just there, out of the blue, in the middle of the program. It's as if they were really excited to have access to real video equipment, but had no structured idea of how and where to actually apply special effects. And then there's editing decisions that were clearly errors. Uh, it's obvious this was produced by someone who didn't quite know what they were doing because every transition away from the weird cloud interviews actually fades the wrong layer before smash cutting to the correct scene. The whole thing has an air of incompetence, but it also feels like someone was getting high on their own supply. Like the BBC employed some director who was just as kooky as the people he was interviewing and all of them believed that cyberspace was the obvious next step towards the coming singularity. When building a virtual world, all of the architects, all of the builders' assumptions and beliefs about the way the world works are fundamentally built right in there. There's no masking. So you can't hide your ideologies even a little bit when you're building virtual environments. All the interviews are with people who are breathlessly convinced that their silly graphical chat rooms are somehow connecting people with a higher form of consciousness. And I can't recommend enough that you go watch the whole thing. I can't do it justice. It's all up on YouTube. There's a link in the description. But let's jump to the Worlds Away footage, which shows up for a bit. Okay, well, the basic idea we started with was we didn't know how to create an automaton, a robot. Basically, everything in the design is driven by a simple principle, which is, does it promote interaction between the people in the world? We've put in all kinds of different ways for people to express themselves. Sure enough, Worlds Away is pretty clearly one of those walk around and talk to people with paper doll avatars kind of things, exactly like what I'd thought Cyberpark was in the first place. So since it's connected to this mic guy, I'm going to assume they were fairly similar. So, there's evidence this game was in development in 91 and 92, and then it disappeared for four years, reappeared in a completely different form, and the last reference I can find to it is an unsourced website that says the game was eventually canceled all the way in 1998. What does this all add up to? Well, I have no idea. I've got nothing. But, as is my way, I'm going to speculate wildly based on nothing more than an impression of what the era was like. I think that in 1990, some guy had the idea of creating Second Life 15 years early, and he managed to talk some venture capitalist into dumping a ton of money into it, which they used to hire devs and actors and rent a studio, and proceeded to produce a prototype, which they showed to Sierra, who really wanted a proper social space for their network, which was, I believe, mostly based around full-on games at that time. So they contracted with the studio, or maybe bought them, and then apparently the game didn't come out in 91, or 92, or 93. Why? Maybe it just took longer than expected, or maybe it got Duke Nukem forever which I think is more likely. It was probably close to done, and then some executive declared that it was based on last generation technology and demanded a reboot in stunning modern 3D. And then of course, as with most projects that end up in development hell, it became an aerobic struggle in which development can never quite outpace technology, and finally the whole thing got shit canned after a decade of work. And again, I just made all of that up, based on a couple tenuous clues and some cynicism. But frankly, this is just how things have been for decades, like in humanity. This story is repeated more times than anyone can count, both in and out of the game industry. So I think it's entirely possible, even likely. If you have any first-hand knowledge to back up or refute my wild speculation, I would love to hear about it in the comments, but otherwise, this is pretty much where the trail goes cold. I wish these had turned out to be something more than they are. They're notionally cool artifacts, but honestly, I would guess that there are countless tapes like this out there with video footage for games that never got finished, and I doubt I'll ever find out much more about these. I admit that I wish they were the tapes from a game people actually knew, or that they contained some fascinating behind-the-scenes scoop, but no dice. All the same, if you'd like to see more of this, you can watch the raw footage over on my second channel. There's a link in the description. Hopefully you had a good time with my amateur detective work and made up storytelling. 
Although this isn't usually my kind of thing, if you liked it, it would be cool if you subscribed. Uh, remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new videos. Uh, but if you really like this, consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here. Without their help, I wouldn't be able to afford this equipment or the space to use it. So I'm extremely grateful to everyone who's supporting me. To everyone else, thanks for watching.